Revelation chapter 1. I have up on the screen verse 4. Let's start at the beginning, work our way down. I won't talk much about the first three verses. We made it through that. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to shew unto his servants things which much shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record, that's John's signature, of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. And we're going to see the Godhead here in the, in the next few verses. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. This is a guidebook, a map to our future. It is a map to our future. It is a, yes, it was written 2,000 years ago, but that's the beauty of the Bible is that it is a sure word of prophecy. And it cannot, it cannot be wrong. Cannot, it doesn't have leaven in it. Doesn't have leaven in it. No, it, it doesn't, because a little bit of it, if there was one lie in the Bible, what would that turn to? And I've made a point of this, but what does adding the word A to John 1.1 1, 1 do? In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was a God. That little bit of leaven right there changes your entire outlook of who Jesus is. The entire outlook. Just that one. And again, we're going to read in verses, the next coming up verses. I won't tell you where they're at, but they're there. We're going to read the Godhead. The Godhead he mentions one after another in different ways but without first john 5 7 we don't have a doctrine about the godhead first john 5 7 is essential to having our doctrine right on who the godhead is the father the son and the holy ghost are three and yet they are one we don't understand it but we believe it for there are three that bear record that's john's signature in heaven and it was uh, my old friend Craig Shaw, I, I've mentioned him a couple times, we went to Bible college together, he went on, you know, I'm a college dropout, he's a college go-getter, I mean, he got a doctorate and everything, and he believes 1 John 5, 7 ought to be there, and he, he said it was funny, because he had a professor, because I mentioned to him, we was talking about it one day, and I mentioned to him, I said, it has John's signature in it, bare record. And he laughed and he said he had a professor that told him, if it sounds too much like John, it ain't John. And I'm going, that don't make sense. So anyway, it's got John's signature in it. But you're going to see the Godhead in here and, and it's essential. This Bible has to be right because... I couldn't hear what you said. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, yeah, no. I'm not going to. I don't know why it does that. That aggravates me. But anyway, it's a, if you want to hear some good preaching, okay? And she's asking it twice. My apologies. I couldn't hear what you said. Oh, shut up. All right. Uh, verse 4. John, to the seven churches. He starts this out like Paul's epistles. And remember what we learned last week. Just because he wrote this to these seven churches, does it only apply to those seven churches? The answer is no, because Paul's letters were written specifically to a specific church, and yet contained in all of them is essential doctrine. It is, it is the truth of what we should believe and warnings against things that we should not believe. So here he says, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace, from him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Now in those two verses you see the Godhead. Name them for me. This is a test. This is a pop quiz. I didn't tell you you were going to get it. You're just getting a pop quiz. Who can identify the three persons of the Godhead in these two verses? Yes, Cindy, did you raise your hand? I thought I saw something go up. I'm going, if you scratch your nose, oh, yeah, see, she's scratching her nose. Huh? Right. 
But how are they identified in these three verses? So I'll give you half credit for that. Right? Well, huh? Lord, give me patience. N- number one, the first person of the Godhead is mentioned as which is and which was and which is to come. That's the first person of the Godhead. Where's the second person of the Godhead? The seven spirits. Now the third person, Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness. And you were right. Who's the, I didn't see that in there, even though I had it underlined. And the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth. So all three of them are mentioned there. Now, we're going to see later that Jesus is going to take God's title or God's name, or God's identification. Because the Father here is represented as from Him which is and which was and which is to come. Showing that God is eternal. He is everlasting. Did God have a beginning? No. And we can't understand that. When we ask the question, where did God come from? There is no answer to that one. Zero answer. Okay? So... He, Jesus later on is going to identify himself with that exact title, showing that he is God. Okay? And you have to be like the Jehovah's Witness. You have to rewrite that, retranslate it, to make it say something that it doesn't say. But anyway, Isaiah 41, 4, it identifies God the Father as the first and the last. Who hath, Isaiah 41, 4, who hath wrought and done it, Calling the generations from the beginning, I the Lord, the first and with the last, I am he. And notice that he mentions, let me get my pen out here. Ah, I hate that. What did I do? Now you guys are going to steal my pen number. Notice that he says, I the Lord, in all capital letters. Okay. That denotes that when the King James translators, and it wasn't just them, it had been done in previous English translations, where they found the letters, the Hebrew letters, Yod, uh, write that out, Yod, He, Va, He. When they found those four Hebrew letters, they knew that that was God's name, And the sacred name people, even the Jews, the Hebrew roots people, and even some people who are hiding their Hebrew roots influence will tell you that the King James translators messed the Bible up by ascribing him the title Lord where they found his name, yod He vah He, how we pronounce it, Jehovah. They said that they made a mistake into the thousands of times because the word Lord in all caps is several, I don't know the exact number, but several thousand times in our King James Bible in the Old Testament. So they say they messed it up, that they got it wrong. Okay. However, what I found is that every time, and I mean every time in the New Testament, where one of the New Testament writers like Mark or Matthew or John, where they were quoting from the Hebrew Old Testament, they always wrote in Greek this word. K-Y-R-I-O. Stop it. S. Kyrios. Which means Lord. Always. So, whenever, um, remember when Jesus said, he's quoting from the book of Psalms. He said, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand. Remember that? Well, when they wrote that in Greek, and they got to the Hebrew word, Jehovah, they wrote the Greek word, Kyrios, and they did it 
100% of the time. Not 99, not 90, not 80, not 70, not half and half, 100% of the time. So what does that tell you? That tells you, and remember, these writers of the New Testament were only writing what the Holy Ghost told them to write. And the Holy Ghost told them to write the Greek word kyrios. The Greek word kyrios is where we get the word curator from. A curator of like a museum, he's the one who is in charge of the museum. He's the one that governs everything that goes on in that museum. Okay? And I don't know of another English word that stems from the Greek word kyrios to explain it, but that's one of them. But it means Lord. So who is, who is changing or who is identifying what yod heh vah should say? God himself is. When he's giving us that word for Lord, he's telling us that's the name. So that's why the King James... See, these guys were not idiots. They were not morons. They were not ignorant and unlearned men. They were very wise, very smart. These men, some of these men spoke multiple languages before they ever got into university. And I mean, they knew the languages. Most preachers, I know what most preachers nowadays do who give you, well, now the original Greek says this, original Hebrew. I know what they do. They don't know those languages. They took a class like I did, but they don't know the languages. They couldn't read it and talk it and speak it. They look in a concordance. And the concordances, by the way, have all been redone since Strong's concordance came out. I don't know when that came out. But now the concordances have been rewritten to reinterpret what these Greek words mean. In other words, you change the dictionary. A hundred years ago, what did the word gay mean? What does it mean now? Sodomite. So we've changed what the word means. An affair. A hundred years ago, what did the word an affair meant? A happening, an instance, an occurrence. Now what does it mean? An adultery. So they're, they're rewriting the dictionaries, the Greek and Hebrew dictionaries, so that the Bibles that are based on Hebrew and Greek are now different because they're re rewriting the dictionaries of what they mean. But Jesus is going to identify himself with Jehovah as the Lord. He's going to identify himself with that here in a minute. Revelation 1 verse 6. Hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be, and this is, I think, very important. Which one of us in this, in this room is a king and priest along with Jesus Christ? That would be everybody who's born again. Everybody. Not just the preacher. Everybody. So in that sense, am I any different than any of you? No. Because a king, God spelled this out in Deuteronomy, that a king, if there's going to be a king over my people, he must write him out a copy of this book and he must rule by the laws of this book. And the priest that carried out the services, they must fulfill their commission by God according to the law that God gave Moses. There wasn't any of them that was above what was written in the book. And his, uh, had hath made us kings and priests unto God and his father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he cometh with clouds. And I'm going to talk about that. He cometh with clouds. We spent some time on that on Sunday afternoon uh, in, Re in Genesis chapter 9 because the bow in the cloud is a type of foreshadowing of Christ when he comes. He's the bow in the cloud. And every eye shall see him and they also which pierced him. So everybody in the world who is alive when Jesus appears in the clouds 
Everybody's going to see him, not just the Christians. Everybody's going to see him, including they also which pierced him. I believe that's the Jews. They are the ones who crucified Christ. Okay. And all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. So for everybody alive, when Jesus appears, they're going to go, uh-oh. But they're going to do more than that. What does the word wail mean? Scream and howl as if in sudden fear, sudden loss, sudden mourning. I unfortunately have seen that. Ben was with a family one time when the husband and father of that family, he was undergoing a procedure on his heart and he died on the table. And I was with them at St. Anthony's when the doctor came out and said, unfortunately, we lost him. And they couldn't hold, they, I mean, we were in a big waiting room. They could not hold it in. They wailed and wailed in that room. That's horrible to see. But understand, the way this world acts toward God and the church, the way California is acting, the way the governor is, the mayor of Los Angeles, Chicago, other places, the way these people are treating God, when Jesus appears, they're going to realize that we were right and they were wrong. Will they repent? It doesn't matter. Because as of this point, it will be too late. Too late. Even so, amen. Matthew 24, turn there. There is... When I started studying the scriptures, instead of the prophecy books, I found out that I was wrong. Now, again, I always say this. I personally do not believe. When you're going to see, you're going to see the word tribulation here in verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days. I do not believe that that is a seven year period, a three and a half year period. I do not believe that this word tribulation represents either one of those time frames. Now I understand that makes me an oddball. I'm used to it. Um, but I cannot see that written for me in scriptures. I cannot find it. I've looked and I've looked and I've looked and I do not see it. So if I can't see it, I can't say it. I can't preach it. I can't teach it. But immediately after the, if you just look at the word tribulation or tribulations in your Bible, just I mean, it just comes in two forms, tribulation, tribulations. If you will look at those words in your Bible, you will see many verses. And if you limit it just to the New Testament, if you want to limit it just to what Paul said, we must, through much tribulation, enter the kingdom of God. Much tribulation. These are they, in Revelation 7, which came out of great tribulation. And I've heard people say, quote that verse and say, these are they which came out of the great tribulation. What did I do? I added the word the. And it's not there in Revelation 7. It ain't there anywhere. The great tribulation. Okay? But I've heard them say that. Because they believe that that's a seven-year period. And obviously, this event takes place after the seven-year tribulation. So this is not, they would say, this is not the rapture. But it sure looks like it. It sure looks like it. Because 
Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven. That event where the sun's darkened, the moon is one, one of two things, shall not give it light and is turned to blood. And the stars fall from heaven. That hap you see that in Joel chapter 2, Acts chapter 2, Revelation chapter 6, at the opening of the sixth seal, you see that. Not the pouring out of the seventh vial, which they say would be the end of the seven-year tribulation, and Jesus comes down in Revelation 19. So that doesn't, it's two pieces of the puzzle that don't go together. So you know what some people do? Cut something off the puzzle piece. <laughs> They do what I do to a Rubik's Cube. Do you know what I did to my Rubik's Cube? I took it apart and put it back together right. Because I spent days going, Ah! I hate this thing! And then I watch these guys on TV that went, they, they was on That's Incredible. And I'm just going, forget to say, I did it. That's how it's supposed to be done. Anyway, the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the son of man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. What did we just see back in Revelation? They're going to wail. And they shall see the son of man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a what? Boom. Trumpet, clouds. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Okay? Uh, Mark 13, 24. This is a parallel passage. But in those days after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. And the stars of heaven shall fall and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. That's the sixth seal. That is the sixth seal okay and then shall they see the son of man coming in the clouds uh, with great power and glory and then shall he send his angels and shall gather together his elect from the four winds from the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of the heaven of heaven luke 21 another parallel passage there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity joel chapter 2 and acts chapter 2 Refer to the signs that are in the heavens. And then both Joel and Acts 2 say that's when the sun is darkened and the moon is turned to blood and the stars fall from heaven and heaven is shaken. Uh, with perplexity, the sea and waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Boom. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now I, I have a theory i see things happening that i think lead are leading up to this because billionaires are have somehow in their mind they've got it in their mind that a big disastrous calamity event is going to take place and they are building bunkers luxury bunkers not like your fathers did in the days of the Cold War where they dug a hole down in the ground and put some canned goods in there, okay? And that wasn't going to last. They're building, they're buying former missile silos because of the, uh, the agreement with Russia to limit our nuclear arms. So they took the nuclear missiles out of these silos and the government is selling off these silos and people are buying them and turning them into luxury bunkers. And then you've got some people who are thinking far beyond that, like Jeff Bezos, the guy who runs Amazon.com, and Elon Musk, who are thinking, well, if it's going to get bad on Earth, maybe we need to escape Earth. It sounds science fiction, but I'm telling I just watched a video this morning about some of the new rockets they're making. Once they get up into space, these new rockets, believe it or not, 
they said, can get us to Mars in about 30 minutes. Instead, because Mars, with just the propellants that we have now, Mars is a 10-month trip. If Mars is in the right place in the sky, and we'll talk about that probably next Sunday. But if Mars is in the right place, we can aim at it and have some guys there in about 10 months. And right now, we, don't, we just can't, can't risk it. But they're building rockets now that they say could get us there literally in 30 minutes. Ion propulsion. Something new, something that NASA didn't have when we went to the moon. Okay, But I'm telling you, I watched Jeff Bezos describe his concept of having this rotating city up in the sky. What does that sound like to you? Sounds like we're trying to build a new Jerusalem in the heavens so that man can finally live in the heavens. What are they doing in Genesis 11? Build a city and a tower whose top may reach into heaven. Okay, and let us make a name for ourselves up there. So that's, go, that's I believe that's, these guys are thinking something's going to happen here. And if we can escape earth, then it won't happen to us. But turn to Obadiah. And Obadiah is only one chapter, so I will tell you, just turn to Obadiah. Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah. So you find Daniel, Hosea. Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah. So you're in, when you get to Obadiah, stay there. And we're going to go back. It, with me, it's on the same page almost. In, in Amos 9, verse 2. Though they dig into hell, then shall my hand take them. That's for the people who are building the bunkers. Though they climb up to heaven, then will I bring them down. Now, that's one witness. Now, turn the page and look at Obadiah. Verse 4. Though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, though thou set thy nest among the stars, thence will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. So it doesn't matter whether how deep they go down or how high they go up. God says, you're not going to escape this. I'm going to bring you back to this place where I'm going to pour out my wrath on you. Okay, now that's just, that's what I see coming in the scriptures. Now, back to Revelation. Verse 8. I, Jesus said, I am the Alpha and Omega. The beginning of... And the ending, saith the Lord, which is, and which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. I asked Pastor Kelly if I was telling that story right about his encounter with some Mormon missionaries. Reg was doing something in town, probably at a feed store or Walmart, something like that. And he saw the Mormon missionaries. And I don't know if he approached them or they came to him. But he was in his truck, they were on their bicycles, and they started their talk. Reg, of course, knew who they were. And he said, boys, I'll tell you what, I'll listen to you if you answer one question. And I don't know if Reg had set this up in his mind earlier, or the Lord just gave it to him, but it's brilliant. And they said, okay. And he said, answer this question truthfully, and I'll sit and listen to you for a while. Is Jesus God Almighty? And the lead Mormon young man, and I went to Bible college with a guy that used to be a Mormon missionary. And uh, he said that, to his knowledge, no Mormon missionary has ever been converted while they're on their mission. They just, it doesn't happen. They are so full of what they've been taught and fed. They have a very intense training course before they turn them out to be missionaries. And he said, these guys just don't turn. So this, this lead missionary, this young man, just sidestepped that question 
and started talking a bunch of nonsense, like Joe Biden. Answered, did, you see, did you see him answer a question the other day? And I'm just going, what did he say now? What is his answer? Anyway, Reg said, hold on a second. You're not answering the question. It's very simple. Is Jesus God Almighty? And the young man, then again, he starts sidestepping the issue, starts going here, there, and everywhere. And finally, Reg said, listen, stop. It's a very simple question. It's a yes or no. Is Jesus God Almighty? And the young man said, no! Just like that. Reg said, okay, thank you for your honesty. And I don't know what happened after that, but I know Reg well enough to know that he quoted Scripture because the Mormons used the King James. And they knew some of those verses he was quoting. But here, right here, Revelation 1, 8, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. Isaiah chapter 9 tells us the names of, of the Savior who's coming, wonderful, counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Now, how can the Son be the Father? I don't understand it, but I believe it, because these three are one. Amen? Okay? If you were to ask me to define and describe the Trinity, all I can do is quote for you verses of Scripture. I'm not going to give you some, well, think of an apple. An apple is a peel and a core, and I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to tell you they are one. And we'll understand it when we get to heaven. Revelation 1.11, if you skip down a few verses, we know we're talking about Jesus saying, I am Alpha Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, and Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Isaiah 41, 4, which is the verse we looked at earlier, who hath wrought and done it, calling the generations from the beginning, I the Lord, the first and with the last, I am he. And Isaiah 48, 12, he says it exactly the way Jesus did. Hearken unto me, O Jacob and Israel, my called, I am he, I am the first, I also am the last. So the God of Jacob in the Old Testament, Jehovah, is Jesus Christ. Because both of them are the first and the last. Amen. Amen. These three are one. See, 1 John 5, 7 just locks all this in place, doesn't it? And if you take that verse out, which it is omitted, in the New International Version, the New English Version, the Revised, not, yeah, the Revised Standard Version, uh, the Holman Christian Standard Bible, the Message Bible, every other Bible, the New King James puts a big mark, a big footnote, on verse 7, and it says at the bottom, the, the uh, best and earliest original manuscripts do not contain 1 John 5, 7. They're telling you, you, even though we put it in the Bible, you don't have to believe it if you don't want to. They're giving you permission. But Christ is God Almighty. Amen. Amen. No doubt in my mind about it. And when you stick with this Bible, that's what you will get out of it. You will, there will be no question in your mind. It just erases all doubt and whatever nonsense is coming over the internet. It erases all of that. And I've had people who ask me questions because they watched something on the internet and said Jesus wasn't God. He wasn't really God. This, and I just, just give them scripture. Give them scripture out of the King James. Now, here's the second issue of why, what Jesus is doing. He says back in verse 8, I am Alpha and Omega. So why is a Jew, why is a Hebrew Jew identifying himself with a Gentile alphabet? Because I can tell you, the Jews of today, and I know this goes back in their tradition probably thousands of years, they regard the Hebrew language as the language to speak 
to God and about God. And the only language. But then again, the Hindu people regard the language of Sanskrit as the only language that properly identifies their 330 million gods and their doctrine. And I can name for you several religions. The Muslims. Muslims say it is an abomination to translate the Quran into any language other than Aramaic or Arabic. It's a terrible thing. In fact, that God hates that or Allah hates that. You only can read the Quran in Arabic, but no other language. So what you have is, you have all these religions in the world with the same idea. That there is a mystical, sacred, holy language. That is the only way to understand their doctrine. And yet, God is just the opposite of that. God says to us, I can be properly identified and spoken of in every language. Amen? What did he do on the day of Pentecost? Gave them languages of the people standing around. And it wasn't Hebrew. And they said, how hear we everyone in our own tongue wherein we were born? The language that we grew up speaking and learning and knowing. How is it that we're hearing these Jewish men speak in our mother language? It was because God gave mankind a gift. A gift that says you don't have to learn a different language like Hebrew and Greek and Aramaic. You don't have to learn those languages in order to properly understand me. God says, I will come to you in your language. And in this case, the Gentile language of the predominant Gentile language of the day. Now, later on, it became Latin because of the influence of the Roman Empire. But here, because the influence of Alexander the Great and the prominence of the Greek Empire at this time, the, the language was Greek. Today, what is it? What do they learn? You know what they teach children in Holland? Dutch? English. You know what people in Kenya know? Most Kenyans know Swahili. Their tribal language and English. They may not understand my accent, but they can read this same Bible. They can read it. Amen. So he identifies himself with the Alpha, the Omega, the two, the first and the last letters of the Greek alphabet. He's changed. He's changed something. And I'll explain that next Sunday. And then, I probably won't be next Sunday, but Jesus actually, in Revelation chapter 1, teaches us the layout of the planets in the sky. Before anybody knew it, that it was like this, Jesus said it perfectly. Now, I'll explain myself probably in a few weeks, probably in a month. Okay? Amen. Are you enjoying this? Amen. Father, bless your word. Oh, there's so much here. This book is so beautiful. Thank you, God, for reviving us in your word and with your word and through your word. Lord, give us blessing today. Bless my pastor friends everywhere. Lord, bless them and give them courage, give them strength, give them the words to speak. Father, bring revival, Lord, to America, Canada, Kenya. Australia, wherever, Father, your word is spoken, bring revival to your people today. We pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.